This is The Courage to be Courageous, and I'm your host, Dan Boland, where people come from all over the world to listen to individuals that have faced their fear and used courage to get through it. And so we're going to talk to some, um, a really, I think, a really fascinating guest today. But before we do, I want to just go ahead and um, thank everybody for their nice comments. I'm getting comments from people from Australia. Uh, we were able to make someone from, in fact, uh, Kevin O'Connor, who's our guest today, was able to make contact through um, Podcast Connections out of Europe. So it's really encouraging to see people are listening to our podcast. Also, I want to encourage all of you to uh, check out the Kirkus Review. I was there for the month of March, and they're actually going to be doing a conversation with me uh, on April 8th that will be out on Kirkus Review. It was a conversation we had, so it'll probably be in writing as well, too. We really want to encourage all of you to continue to have a voice for our community it's important not only for the LGBT community, but also for our heterosexual allies as well, too. want to make one comment with my website. We've been having some problems, and my web designer is on it right now where people use Contact Me, and it's not somehow it's not coming through to me. So I want to give you my email directly here. It's Dan Bolen, D-A-N-B-O-L-E-N, at cox, C-O-X, dot net. So for any of you that would like to email me or talk to me, use my email and I will definitely get right back to you as well too. So I also want to encourage you to, here we're starting into 2024. I'll be doing a number of podcasts for the whole year. I want to know what you want to hear on my podcast Uh, We've got some great guests lined up that will be coming out here in the near future. But I want to hear what you have that you would like to hear on the podcast because you're part of the inclusive community that we're at, not only for the LGBTQ people, but for the heterosexual allies as well. I want to encourage you to get back with me and let me know the types of programs, the types of things that you would like to hear us talk about. So I'd like to welcome Kevin O'Connor here, and Kevin has a fascinating story. And first of all, I'm going to talk about his book, and then we're going to come back to it in just a minute. He wrote a book, Two Floors Above Grief. Interesting book, isn't it? Let me read the back of this. It'll give you some insight as to how Kevin was raised It said, nobody has a house like this. Set from the 1920s to the 1980s, two floors above grief is full of fascinating details and anecdotes about his upbringing as a funeral home child, brought to vivid life through a compelling collection of letters written by various family members who lived and worked together at the O'Connor Funeral Home in Elgin, Illinois. Blending the 24-hour business of death and its constantly ringing phone with joy experienced through music, radios, pets, backyard basketball games, co-parenting, faith, and celebration, O'Connor offers a reflective tale of affirming the love of family and embracing life. So that's an encouraging and I think a really thought-provoking title <laughs> to get this really interest in this book, Two Thanks. Floors Above Grief. So, Kevin, tell us how that you decided to write that book. Why, why was that important for you? Well, great question, Dan. Thanks. Thanks. Good question. Um, it was important to me because um, I, was, I had these stories in my head for many years as did other people in my family. And it's, uh, as, a, as the subtitle says of the book, it, I grew up in a, unique, in a unique place that we called home. And um, now, through my life, I didn't meet many other people mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that had similar experiences in being uh, not only the child of a funeral director, 
uh, but also living in the environment of a funeral home. There's not a lot of us out there <laughs> compared, <laughs> compared, the to the general, no, <laughs> compared to the general population. Uh, I did have the good fortune to go to college with two or three other people uh, in the Chicago area who also grew up in similar environments. So we had that to share in our friendship. But uh, what motivated me to write it was because I knew this story was unique. I also knew that I had a treasure trove of uh, communications, written communications um, that were handwritten, typed um, on various elements of paper and uh, things like that by my by my family. And those were written not I have a I didn't refer to it in the letter, but the first letter I have is a letter typed in 1937 in triplicate with carbons by my grandfather to his uh, to his his uh, my father and his five siblings. Fascinating. So and then um, the next letter was probably uh, was a letter was a note handwritten note written by my mom on the evening of her honeymoon uh, in nineteen in June of thirty nine. Uh, and then there's a gap. Then the bulk of the letters, though, come from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, 60s, uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, during a time when I was away at college. My parents were writing letters. We didn't have internet then. We didn't have anything like we have nowadays. Um, and uh, as you know, you and I are. I think you and I are similar uh, generations. Uh, we, uh, we most people communicated with with handwriting letters and putting them in a mailbox and mailing them. So I had this treasure trove of letters that had been saved by family members and myself. And about ten years ago, I took maybe even more now. I took it upon myself to uh, organize these letters and, and thought, what do I do with these? What do, how do I make sense of them? So as I as I got them organized and reread them and read what was revealed in them. I knew I'd always wanted to write a book about my family and the work they did and the servitude of the, of the funeral industry and, and how exemplary they were uh, what, and what an interesting environment was for, for me to live there. But these letters, having these letters just motivated me in it even further to put the book together. So that's uh, when I started. I started the process in uh, May of 21 to put all this, these resources and these ideas and these thoughts together. And similar to your writing process, just uh, wrote, got the book written, found a way to self-publish it. Uh, and have now been in the midst of marketing and, and doing things to get the, the word out there about the book. So that, that's, a, it, that's a summary of what's been going on in the last uh, 74 years. And, so. and, and I actually have ordered uh, Kevin's book. It arrived a couple of days ago, and I've had a chance to just look at several sections of it. And I find it fascinating and interesting. And little part about his dad, when he found out that uh, Kevin came out as gay, how supportive his dad was. I think it's very touching, mm -hmm. and I want to read yeah. that from oh, the book sure. as Thanks. well. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. idea of two levels above grief, mm -hmm. um, because the, fu the, the funeral home was on the bottom, the basement for the caskets and embalming, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then the funeral home on the main level, and mm -hmm. then your uncle and his family on the first level, and you're on the next level. Right, right. So that's why it's two floors above grave. Yeah, because uh, and that's it. Because the first, like you said, the first floor was the funeral home, and the second and third floor uh, had been converted. Well, this was an old Victorian house built and uh, opened it up and built in the eighteen eighties. Eighteen eighty seven, I think, was the year that people started living there. And my uncle had a chance after his business had been growing in this town. He needed more space. And in 1939, he had the opportunity to buy this house, which had gone into a little bit of disrepair uh, due to the economic times of the Depression and things like that. So there's a picture uh, of the house. right? Oh, there. there are, thanks the for showing that up. That's yeah. the actual house I grew up in. That's the actual so, house he grew up in. Yeah. So that was that was an interesting place to grow up in. And I love that sketch of the house, the artist who put that together, but uh, Laura Sanchez. And um, so. And the floors above the so my uncle and my dad, who was just newly married and uh, about to um, 
they have the birth of his oldest son, my older brother, in 1940. They got into that house and, and reconverted the house into the first floor using the, what if you picture an old Victorian house, <laughs> um, that would have been the parlors and the entryway. And uh, so they converted that into parlors for the funeral home business and an office. They had to add a bathroom, uh, a WC, because there had, hadn't been one there uh, for the clients. And then the upper two floors, the next floor was had been all bedrooms uh, in the original house, and they reconverted those five bedrooms into um, uh, a kitchen, mm -hmm. a living room, a dining area, uh, bedrooms, bathroom. Uh, they did all that. And then the third floor had been a ballroom. So the owners of this house through the years who they did entertaining, they um, the ballroom was the third floor. And actually, there was two stages in that third floor. And when my mom and dad converted that space into their apartment, putting in, putting in a kitchen and a living room, kitchen, living room, bedrooms, uh, bathroom, uh, family type room, they did all that on the third floor. But they left the stages there. Uh, uh, and that, so in my bedroom, there was an actual performance stage where orchestras used to play. <laughs> and so uh, from the time I came home in 1950, and they put me in a bassinet, I presume, my, until I was about eight or nine, my, my bedroom was next to that stage. And so um, I, I do a lot. I do quite a bit. I keep active in community theater and performing. And uh, I think, and I've been doing that from a good part of my life. And I think part of that, part of that, it's in my genes uh, because of sleeping next to a stage for all those years. <laughs> and the uh, and the idea that that was sort of our part of our play area. My brothers and cousins and friends and I would play on the stage and underneath the stage. There was great little hiding places under the stage as well and storage that my parents used. But anyway, I, that was that was another thing that made uh, this all intriguing and very unique, and certainly part of the, another reason that I wanted to to put these stories out there. So excellent. Now we're yeah. going to talk a little bit about Kevin's life here. Um, I think you're going to find it interesting, as I did. Um, I'd like to also, if I could, give them your website before I forget. It's mm -hmm. www. Kevin O'Connor author dot com is that yeah correct? and yeah and then one one thing people o'connor is a pretty common celtic name but sometimes people spell it er but my our spelling which is the more conventional the more useful or the use usable the name is o'connor so it's kevin o'connor author dot com mm -hmm. very good and so you can check him on the website you get a chance to see his book and uh, you're going to learn some i think some very fascinating Stories. We're going to find out a little bit about uh, Kevin's personal life. Now, he went uh, into La Jolla University, I believe, where you got your BA in political science, and, uh, political science and a minor in English. And I believe you got that in 1972? Yeah, and that was from the, the, the school called Loyola, L-O-I-O-L-A. Right. And the that's Loyola. a Jesuit, yeah, that's Loyola University. That's a Jesuit university in Chicago. There's also the same named university, right, not too far from you, Loyola Marymount. That's in Los Angeles. So, uh, no, you're in Skywell. It's not too far from you. In my mind, I was thinking you were Palm <laughs> Springs. But anyway, there's a, so Loyola uh, has four around the country, all the Jesuit instit institutions, for lack of a better word. Uh, but um, that's where I went to undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then you went on and to the University of California at Berkeley and got your master's degree in education mm -hmm. curriculum. And I mm -hmm. believe you got that in 1977? Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I'd was uh, i been teaching in the Bay Area and had gone to, been going to school at Berkeley and then completed my master's while I was teaching school in a town called uh, Vallejo, which is at the north part of the bay there. Yes, I'm familiar California. with that as well, too. Yeah. Okay. So let's tell us a little bit about you were obviously teaching and eventually ended up become a principal. But mm -hmm. let's talk about the fact is that you decided you wanted to get married and have a family. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I had... Um, 
I got I married a, a friend that I, I knew from college, a very good friend. We're still good friends. Continue our friendship. And uh, I married uh, her and, and um, in 1975. That was Sheila. And, yeah, right. Sheila, okay. And we had, we had an excellent, and still do, have an excellent relationship. And uh, actually with her, I was able to open up a little bit. Uh, we had uh, about my perceptions of being attracted to men at the time. I'd, I uh, didn't know what to do with those feelings, but she was able to let me talk about it. And actually was the one who encouraged me to get in some counseling. So I did that. And um, and we we proceeded. She uh, I proceeded with my counseling. We also uh, also proceeded with a pre-planned move from our location in the Bay Area back to our uh, Chicago area where we had both been raised. And um, and then that uh, that marriage lasted until 1980. And. Uh, we just came to a decision uh, through some counseling, some joint counseling, uh, that uh, we weren't going to proceed with the marriage. It took and a lot of courage on your part to come out to her. And well, and she was accepting in that sense, wasn't she? Well, sure. And I, I certainly don't want to. Uh, and when we talk about courage, mm-hmm. uh, I want to talk about her, too. Mm-hmm. Both because, uh, yeah, for, for her to... Uh, be open to me to talk about it and to um, share uh, th- those conversations with each other and to try to find a route or a journey in- into uh, find a route through a journey that neither one of us were that familiar with and we we weren't familiar with it. Uh, you know what do we do about that? So yeah, we 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 got through that and we had a period of time after the the divorce where we didn't speak for quite a while. And through the um, magic of the Internet about 20 years ago, uh, maybe a little, yeah, 15, 20 years ago, we started communicating and we've reestablished our friendship and have a whole wonderful camaraderie uh, together with, uh, yeah, piecing, joining our two lives together and, and talking about our, our what's going on in our lives now. And, and it's been wonderful, a wonderful reconciliation. You know, Kevin, that's, a, I think, a, a very fascinating story. Now, you did come out to her, and then you guys divorced. But I think this is going to be an interesting thought for our audience. Why did you remarry again, knowing that you were gay? Oh, boy. Well, I think, uh, and probably some of your listeners can relate to this, Um I think I view coming out as not a, uh, a a one event type thing. It's a it's a multitude of events. And I was, I was listening today on your podcast or somebody else. We never stop coming out. That is <laughs> just, correct. Yeah. And um, so what um, what happened after I got divorced? Uh, we got not I after we uh, we divorced. I just. Uh, even though I had the courage, I had the courage or the impetus to be seeking counseling and getting some help about it, I I made a decision just to put that feeling of uh, being gay back into the pit of my stomach. Mm-hmm. Stuff, it stuff stayed, in the box, right? Stuff yeah, in the box. stuff in the box. Where are we talking? If we can talk about mm-hmm. a closet, we can talk about whatever. Mm-hmm. For me, that feeling of being gay in a personal sense, was usually just something that sat in a section of my abdomen, for lack of a better word. It was there, and there was times when it didn't come out at all. And so, so what happened was, in um, I just I was teaching school at the time, and um, involved in various social circles. And mostly with no other gay contact at that time in terms of friendships or anything. So it was, it was a lot of friends I'm, I still talk to and still see. But um, and that's where I met my second wife within that um, environment of my teaching profession and the social networks that I had at the time and proceeded into that relationship and quickly started a family, which Part in my own thinking about, I know I know being gay isn't a choice. We have a choice of what to do with uh, one being gay, 
And I chose to just keep turning it away. And uh, because I really wanted to have a family. I wanted to be a dad, as you know from the book. I had um, some very good models of parenting. And I wanted to, I had, I wanted to do that myself, be a dad, and um, didn't think at that time in 1980, 79, 80, I didn't see a way that I could do it. That you could have children, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the reasons I buried uh, my homosexuality was if I wanted to be a dad, um, I was going to find the the satisfaction and pleasure and, and enjoyment of life. Um, without professing myself openly to be gay, do you th- do you think um, at so the that's time? What I did. Do you think at the time, Kevin, was there you buried it deeply? Um, do you feel that you had shame around being gay? Um, oh yeah, I think I, I probably I've, as the years have gone on, I'm, I know that was part of it. The shame and knowing that if I had um, come out at that time. There was the questions that I think that a lot of people in the coming out process face. What's my family going to think? What are my friends going to think? Am I going to lose my friends? Am I going to lose my family? What's going to happen to me? Um, All the questions that just kept putting me further, further back, even though I I'd stepped out and the the, I'd stepped out with with uh, my wife and the counselors I was seeing at the time to examine it. And even though I would got to a little a little bit farther in my process and admitting who I was, I chose to bury it again. Yes. Okay. And um, and that's that that became the next for lack of a phase of my life was parenting and husbanding and throwing myself really and willingly and and um, no without regrets into being a dad mm-hmm. and. Um, Doing all the things I saw my parents do for me, and how I and how I observed my older brother be a father to his kids, I did that. And as I proceeded to become involved in that, and just and then as a as a teacher and a school principal, um, I didn't see many avenues uh, or even a need at the time. <laughs> To come out again, it would still be there and it was in my head and I, there would be inklings and things that I would say, I really need to do something about this or, oh, it's just a pass. It'll go away. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I knew it was never going to go away fully. Um, I knew enough about it that it, it was it was part of who I was. And, and uh, but that was the way I was handling it at the time and just um, loved being a dad, still do. Uh, and just enmeshing myself on all their activities and volunteer work and doing what I could to um, help at their schools and everything. And that just kept uh, keeping that uh, keeping that gay part co- uh, contained mm-hmm. in a little spot in me. And uh, the only place I could pull it out was in my own head. And I was so busy with everything else. I didn't I was working my job, getting my doctorate degree. I didn't spend a lot of time. Uh, focusing on that part of myself. Uh, I, th- I so. think Kevin made a comment when we did a prelude. He, I had too much on my plate <laughs> to yeah, think about think, anything else. Kids and Boy Scout, yeah. you you're taking them to to social events, and and it mm-hmm. showed the love you had for your boys and the love you oh, had yeah. for your family. Yeah, and I, I guess as I talk about that and and now follow so many people social media wise, and you've had them on your show too. Some of them, so many of our youngers, people that um, are younger than us, have been able to to blend and be authentic in their authentic selves and have a relationship and have a family and do all the things I did as a dad. I just didn't see that as possible at the time. And I think the generation so, you lived in it was not possible because no, we've come a long way. No, I don't think so. Since oh, then. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think the and as I came out fully, um it's been uh almost 20 years uh when I was 55, but I've had so many other opportunities now to um provide service and to uh be involved with the LGBT community in ways that I never dreamed of. 
I uh, never thought of when I was carrying around this um, lump in my stomach mm-hmm. uh, that many years ago. But now to be at a spot where uh, I, I'm in a wonderful relationship with my husband, we're active in the in the uh, in many communities, gay community being one, but also the last ten years of my employment in the school system um, here in Broward, uh, Fort Lauderdale. I was an LGBT advocate for kids, for parents, for staff. I wrote uh, a lot of the curriculum that was in place in schools. In addition to the work with LGBT, I wrote, I helped write the family life and sexual health curriculum. We determined ways to uh, make HIV testing available to all students at a number of high schools in our in our district. Of course, <laughs> with the current political um, climate in Florida, those programs are all gone now. Yeah, and that's been that's been hard to let go of. Well I, com- to see, I commend to see you that. for that, Kevin, because you had a voice. You had a voice. You did something with your voice by doing what you just talked to us about. We all must have a voice. We cannot be silent. Now it may be curtailed for a while. Right. But our voice will always come back. We just have and that's, to keep Yeah, and that's what I believe. And, and I've I, always been a, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go, you're fine. Go ahead. No, I, I think about it a lot of times and I tell my colleagues, you know, hey, the, the stuff we wrote, this, these programs we put together, these PowerPoints, these presentations, this, these audiences we presented to, they didn't go away. And we did this not only on a local scale, we did... We, we planned state conferences and national conferences for people that worked in school districts, with some of which still go on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, just, it's just taken a different route in okay. Florida. And, uh, but I, when I tell my colleagues, it doesn't mean that's going to go away. It doesn't mean the work we did in our district. I, I picture a phoenix. Uh, I picture, um, well, not in the, not in the city sense. I think you know what I mean, since I'm speaking to you in Phoenix. But um, yeah, the, the Phoenix will rise, and um, as the, the, as the political um, vibes change, that I think uh, the programs that a lot of the districts in Florida had to give up will come back. So I agree with that. Now, this is, I think this is going to be an interesting part of Kevin's story because he had two sons, was very involved with his sons, was a very good father. Um, he hadn't, of course, come out to his wife at the time or his two boys. Um, but give us some uh, insight as to one of your boys, I believe it was your younger one, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When yeah. he was 16 years old. Tell us about mm-hmm. this experience. Yeah, when he was a teen, um, let's see, 16, would have been around 19, about around 2000. Um, he, I started to noticing, his mom and I started to notice things uh, in the house and um, on the computer and things like that, that, uh, that, he too had a intrigue or um, interest uh, in in other men and boys, and so I took it upon myself to just sit down and talk to him about it, or just bring it up. But yet, even in doing it, I thought in my head, I thought, "Here, <laughs> Kevin, you're you're talking to your son about it, but you haven't done this yourself." <laughs> So part of my own process of coming out was dealing with my own inauthent- inauthenticity, uh, my own hiding, and talking as I was wanting what was best for him and wanting to help him as, as I had done in many other of his things through life. Um, I felt, well, I need to do something about this as well. I, I had been... Uh, Already at that time, I was talking to counselors. Um, we all we had family counselors, and also I was talking to a counselor on my own who was helping me come to this and to put the what I call it, the gay card to put the gay card on the counseling table and not to bury it anymore, not to pretend it wasn't there, not to say oh I'll deal with that later. To we talked we used the analogy that I had too much on my plate. Well, I, I, to keep with that analogy, I, I worked to make that the main portion for a while yes. and, and, and so that I could really deal with it and had two 
really good counselors at that time period. So I was working with them as well as is watching Mark evolve and helping him in any way I could and and then coming more fully out to to their mom. So that that presented a whole other series of steps in my own process and my own coming out process. And uh, I just took it day by day. Keep I journaled a lot at the time. I uh, just uh, found people that I could other people that I could talk to that had shared similar experiences that I learned about people, other men and marriages that had found ways to to come to grips with that. And um, I I listened and I asked and I asked some more questions and got more answers and asked more questions. This kept evolving and, and trusted uh, people and eventually was just able to get more fully aware of what was going on and, and make some major steps. Were you able at that time or shortly after to come out to your son as gay and your wife as gay at that time? Well, uh, actually, if I go back over the sequence, um, the, this, the discussions with my wife, you know, were part of our own counseling process. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, um, but I didn't, I made a decision uh, with the boys that I really wouldn't, I wasn't going to come fully out with them <laughs> until all the legal things of the divorce happened. I figured right. that was, um, that was enough that this the whole concept of the marriage splitting up and the divorce and our family structure changing was enough. And so that whole process of me leaving the house and uh, finding another place to live and going through the legal proceedings, that took a little bit over a year. Mm -hmm. And um, it was shortly after the divorce that I that I sat down with each one of the boys uh, individually and told them and I gave them a little more background about the, the, the breakup of the marriage and who I was. And that that was very freeing. I'm in I'm concurrent with concurrent with that. I was having similar discussions with my brothers, my two brothers, because I, I had um as soon as the, when the divorce happened is when I started then to talk more to fam my boys and family, other cousins, other people to get that out on the table to have people identify who I really was. Did your so, family and your boys and your wife and your your brothers and family accept you as a gay mm -hmm. man? Yeah, all the fears I had uh, for years. <laughs> And my first wife, too. Um, all the fears I had to the um, were not present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, I think we're on this journey, you know, for different reasons and things happen in time for a reason. So, I mean, even though I had these fears of when I was 20 something um, and didn't act on didn't act on the coming out process. Um, I think there's there's a reason <laughs> that things happened to come out when I did. But um and and I always think that's interesting because we have a tendency in fear to start thinking what we think other people will think. And we really have no business because we don't know what your wife's <laughs> going to think. Know. We don't, we don't know, know what your kids are going to think. You don't mm -hmm. know what your brother we don't is. Know. So we get ourselves caught in the squat thinking this yeah. is what they're going to think. And in the majority of cases, those fears are unreal. Yeah. Um, I and mean, certainly I've read about other people in positions similar to ours. Yes. That it didn't fare well and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and didn't resolve. And um, people that, you know, lost their families and mm -hmm. lost their children. And, and I, I feel very... Um, blessed and fortunate. And even though I don't talk too much about this part of my life in the book, Two Floors Above Grief, when I read over and think about the kind of environment I grew up in, I feel very blessed, very fortunate that uh, my family has is accepting, has welcomed 
well, they never unwelcomed me, but mm-hmm. it, it's, it, and I really think, I think you and I mentioned this the other day, you know, and part of me wishes there never was this thing called the coming out process. Yes. I wished we didn't have to deal with that. I wished um, there was a way in life that, and I think that's happening a little bit more for younger generations. Um I wish there was a way that just people could be who they were from the get go mm-hmm. and not have judgments or questions or um, well, things and, that are going to instill and, fears in them. And I think yeah. it, it, because let's, let's, let's just take this for what it really is. Heterosexuals don't come out. Right. Homosexuals right. are coming out. It should be equal, accepted it for who be. you are, the way you were born. And I hope we'll see a generation of time when that will actually happen. I want to yeah, share a too. comment um, in Kevin's book about his dad. And because sometimes it doesn't go well with our family. Uh, sometimes we lose our family. But mm-hmm. even in a loss, mm-hmm. there's always a gift. I lost my whole yep. family except my daughter. Mm-hmm. And, but the gift I have is a gift of freedom and peace of being my authentic self. Right, That's the right, gift right. I came, even though I lost most of my family. But I want to um, read a little part of this book. This is where uh, Kevin is asking his dad to meet at Floyd's restaurant. It says, we met at Floyd's restaurant, West Dundee. I talked about my perception of him, the appreciation I had of our relationship the confuses I was feeling about male-female gender attributes and my marriage. Although I had feared the conversation, my trust in dad was readily reconfirmed. I started an easy in conversation, but quickly switched to easy dialogue with him. I let him know that Sheila and I were open and honest with each other, She was an excellent listener when I told her I was concerned about my attraction to men. Dad did not look surprised or judgmental. He encouraged me to continue talking. He made it comfortable for me to reveal a physical relationship I had with a male friend at La Jolla. Is that you say at La Jolla? Oh, Loyola. 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 Loyola, yeah. I told Dad that I had met with a male friend during the spring of my first year of college. I told Dad what it was like to come home for that summer with a secret about the relationship and how I kept my feelings inside me until I spoke to Sheila and now him seven years later. Dad, as always, was exemplary listener. He conveyed an understanding and said he wished I had spoken to him about my feelings when they were occurring. But he appreciated that I was sharing it now. As fearful as I was about inquiring what he and mom thought about this aspect of my life, dad was supportive. He was noticeably and intentionally interested. He spoke and let me know that he loved me. He talked about the perception of several people he knew having a range of feelings about sexual orientation, although we did not use those words. He expressed no disdain. He encouraged me to keep on going to counseling. What an incredible supportive dad. (laughs) I mean, I think it went... Many of us didn't have that, but... No, and, I, and even as you read it, just makes I'm, you're reading about my own father. And I, yes, but that's so incredible because mm-hmm. many of us lost family and got rejected from family. Oh, but yeah. It's nice to hear yeah. a story about a father and even later your mother that was affirming of who you are. It's mm-hmm. a gift, Kevin. Always appreciate that gift. I know, and I think um, what it taught. One of the things it taught me uh, when I would be working with kids when they would come with high school kids, when they would come to me with questions about what do I, how do I tell this to my parents? And I, and I would share the story and I could appreciate their fears. And I said, well, you have to, 
I know it's important to tell your parents, but I don't know about your home life. I don't know. I didn't want to put them in a situation that was dangerous either mm-hmm. uh, to them. And But I would just share with them that story when I that that story. I was 29 when I had that conversation with my dad. So, you know, still older than they are at 17, 18, 19. But I think, um, where was I going with this? Just the idea, yes, I feel very blessed Mm -hmm. that I was able to have that conversation with dad. Nothing was said after that. He watched me proceed from there into a second marriage, (laughs) um, become a father. Uh, Nothing was ever discussed again about that. Uh, for whatever reason, and I, he he died uh, seventy nine five years after that conversation. Um, and there's a part of me that says, "Ah, oh, gosh, if I'd only continued the conversation." <laughs> um, but he just um, he was an observer, a supportive observer. He was there for me with every um, family crisis situation I had, whether it was architectural or plumbing or you know. Having a discussion with him about what I was going to do. I, I, and, I think um, also it took courage on his part because remember, he was in a generation that did not, did not accept homosexuality. No. And yet he accepted his son as a gay man. That is a powerful comment and shows the type of character your dad was and the yeah, love that he had yeah. for you, Kevin. I just I think, applaud that so much. And I think he was ahead of, well, if, if there is a, if there is truth to the statement ahead of his time. Yes. He had an awareness. He was born in 1913 and graduated from high school in 1932 and did his trainings and got his certificates and all that and was running this business. But there was something in him, in his upbringing, in the people he knew, he mentioned that, that he knew people that were attracted to same to the same sex, and I can think about some of the friends that he knew now, female and male. Yes, and yeah. so he. But even in that setting in the 1970s, he had an, an understanding. Mm-hmm. I don't know who else he talked to about it, but when I was able to talk to him about it, he was right there for me, and um, he he was a. You Pretty a, decent individual. You had a great father, a great father, mm-hmm. and a great mm-hmm. mother as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now you met Leon, and uh, yeah. you became friends before you became a couple. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, what's your life like today with Leon? Oh, wow. It takes my breath away. He's out <laughs> walking the dog right now. <laughs> <laughs> and after this, we're going to go out with some friends for dinner. Um, but that's, that's our life. We, we've been together um, next week on the 31st, we celebrate uh, nine years of legal marriage. But and then July, we get to celebrate uh, what are we at now? 205, mm-hmm. 19, 19 years of being together. So um, uh, it's when I uh, made the decision to separate uh, and divorce from my second wife, um, my kid's mother. Um, I had no idea what I was going to be doing. I, I, I just knew it was important for me to be honest with myself, be honest with my wife and my children and my family. Mm-hmm. But for me, I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I, um, I'm no longer a religious person, mm-hmm. but I got to feel that there's other things that are guiding because it was within, um, within a month or two after I um, decided and made the decision to, to uh, move forward with uh, separation divorce proceedings, that I met Leon. And I wasn't looking for that. I wasn't, I wasn't ready to do any of that. Um, I was just trying to keep my own head together, and I was being challenged with that. But to have him come into my life at that time, along with the support of two or three other men in my life who had been either longtime friends from elementary school, college friends that were part of my life at the time. That was the uh, was another college friend that led me to Leon, mm-hmm. a, a friend that I'd been able to be upfront with about my my thinking and my situation. And another friend who 
um, Michael, who lives in Palm Springs, who is very supportive of, of me in going through this process. So I, I treasure that. But to have Leanne come into my life, uh, that was a gift. That, that's such a gift. And, and I, I um, and you were able to give him your authentic self. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah and you yeah. were being totally authentic. And, yes. And that and, was and, and with he especially. And then but with these other friends to be able to freely talk about who I was and not. It's like this pit in my stomach that I've been carrying around since I was probably 13 or 14. This pit in my stomach. I just kept percolating up and kept um, getting out of my digestive tract. For, yeah. <laughs> for like, and just it, it's it's gone now. I mean, that's that nothing I don't have to worry about. And mm-hmm. I don't have to. Um, yeah, it's to go to events, whether they're straight oriented or gay oriented. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just we are together. We are a couple. We are. Um, recognize for who we are as individuals, but also who we are together. And that, I mean, that, that happened when I was married to both my wives too, but um, it, it's just the idea that um, to have that kind of acceptance is just very, very powerful. Excellent. And to, and to, and to be very, and to be so, so comfortable mm-hmm. in my home and um, in the homes I was in before I, certainly had a, a degree of comfort and made myself as comfortable as I could, but there was still that one element yes, yes. that I hadn't dealt with. So, um, but you've dealt with it now and you're living the best yeah, life yeah. you can live right now. Yeah. As your yes. authentic self. Yes, I yes, always ask yes. my, um, my guests on my podcast is you're going to have different people from different walks of life. Mm-hmm. Um, some gay, some lesbian, some trans, some mm-hmm. heterosexuals. Uh, what would you like your story, the lesson of your story to teach others? In other words, if you could summarize a point or two, how your story can help others to be their authentic selves. Hmm. Um, well, I think part of my story, and I certainly have... I have some regrets, I guess, of how things, but also I can't live in that regret. Um, There's a a term in Yiddish that I learned from Leon. It's called the shirt. B-E-S-H-E-R-T. And the shirt. And it just means meant to be. And um, I think as each of us start to exp- each each individual who's seeking to come out or seeking what to do with their pit in their stomach or their pit in their mind or whatever um i would i would say uh, i'm not sure if there's a right or a wrong way to do this it's just i i would say that the thing is just to do something yes because if we don't do something and i think uh, it's going to kill you it's and and the people. pit will not go away. And, the pit will not go away. And, and in I fact, think, it will get bigger. Yes, and, and hurt and more hurtful. And, and more hurtful. And, and I think, too, is... Um, <laughs> but yet, if I had done... Yet then I look back. If I had done things differently... You wouldn't have I Leon made, on your life. <laughs> well, that, but even back then, if I had done things differently... I might, I might not have had children. Had I children, might not have had yes. the pleasure of being fathers. The other thing that I come to grips with sometimes, and that the whole thing about the shared and things are meant to be, um, when I, I, in my work with um, uh, LGBT advocacy, HIV work, um, uh, and uh, have had had the the opportunity to see the quilt and different, uh, the AIDS quilt and different um, presentations, uh, the whole thing, as well as pieces of it. And when I look at those, the timelines on those quilt, those are my timelines. Those are men that were born in the 40s and the 50s, like me. And uh, they have an ending date. Uh, and I, I wonder sometimes, here's the beshared, or here's the meant to be, if I had proceeded when I was 20, 21, 22, 23, 
to come out and, and be involved and make decisions at that time during those tumultuous times, would I even be here? And um, so I think the realization I come to is something, again, I haven't, I'm not a religious person anymore, but I think there was, I have to believe there was somebody, something steering me into the decisions I was making. Mm -hmm. They, they had a, they had another purpose for me. Right. And that purpose was for me to come to this resolution of who I was uh, and to then be presented with the opportunity to meet a wonderful man like Leon and then to be put into educational positions, which education was my passion, but to end my 10 years of, of, of my educational career in an LGBTQ environment. Um, Powerful story. And, and helping other Powerful. and helping kids and adults and, and providing service. We talk about the funeral home industry as being one of servitude. Certainly teaching is one of servitude. But um, also things with um, the advocacy that I was able to get involved, have been involved with and still, and, and even though I'm not fully employed in the education system anymore, I, I think... Um, I think there's a purpose and a reason, and there's a reason to every one of those people's names on the quilt, too. I, I think I read, it, you, you made a comment here, and I think this was so powerful. We have resources now that are available for us. All of mm -hmm. us are going to have struggles. All of us are going to have fear. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you and I had that in our generation. We did not have the resources available that they have available today. Mm -hmm. I've always felt be a part of a community. We didn't have a community back in our area. People no. kept gay under the table. In fact, people couldn't even say the word gay. But we have resources. We have a community. Um, hopefully my website, my, my memoir, The Courage to Be Courageous, your memoir, Two Floors Above Grief, will be able to help people to be able to be their authentic self. And you made a comment in our prelude, and I want to share this. Get more information. The more information you have, your fear will become less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So get more information. We have that available on the website. We have it available through our podcasts. We have it available through our community right now. There's many great community networks that people can belong to and be their authentic selves. And I think you made that point so powerful, clear in your book, and I think also in this podcast with you. So I thank you so much, mm -hmm. Kevin. We want to be able to get his book in front of you, Two Floors Above Grief. A memoir of two families in the unique place we called home. And I thank you, Kevin, so much for taking the time to share the podcast oh. today. <laughs> hopefully, I enjoyed spending the time with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, we'll get a chance to meet. I think you said your brother lives in Scottsdale. Yeah, they, they live in Scottsdale. I, I'd like to get out there sometime. If so. you do, we can. We definitely would meet with my partner as well. Sure, sure. You have great. an empowering story. Uh, thank you so much for sharing it for our listeners. Thank you for all the courage you throw to, showed to be courageous. And thank you for being on my podcast, Kevin. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the time you've taken. I appreciate it. And you've been a great questions, great preparation. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad you've, you've dipped into the book a little bit. And um, I'll, I'll text you another. I think we talked about there. I think Aiden sent you a, a sample of that book, uh, Journey Out. I, I just ordered be, it. It actually arrives today. I've already that would ordered be helpful. it. Yes, that would I be think another. You have, a, you have a chapter in there about yeah, you. Kevin. Yes. Kevin's chronicle. Yes. but that might be helpful to your listeners as well. Oh, so. excellent! So it's called Journey Out. Mm -hmm. And who was it written by again? Well, it was edited by a person named Gene mm -hmm. um, Eugene Eugene Probasco. Probasco, and he uh, gathered the stories of. Uh, this was fifteen years ago now, probably. He gathered the stories of uh, 10 men who had made the decision to um, exit their marriage, journey out of their marriage, and um, how, what went into their thinking, what went into their thoughts, 
how, how they did that um, and just how they proceeded on their journey. So on that, and I happen to be one of the, the chapters. So. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it as well. I'll be reading your book again. Thank you, Kevin, for having the courage to be okay. courageous. Thank you so much for being on my podcast with me. Hey, Dan. Thank you. You take thank care you. now. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.